the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah, there's a stigma. There's a, do I really need this? It just is hard to pick up and... You don't want to be the person that wants help all the time. Like, hey, right. figure it out yourself. And can this person really help me? Right, Who's right. this going to be? How do I find a therapist? There's a That's lot of factors. The most frequent question I get yeah. from my friends and family and people, I'm thinking I might need to see someone. Like, how do I go about doing that? Mm. Get that question all the time. So, so yeah, for cops, it's even bigger because of that whole control thing. Yeah. And also, like I said before, their job is on the line. Of course. So for these cops that are in that situation, so when they say, look, I need to take some time off, you you basically just leave them alone and say, if you want these resources, here they are. Or do they, I mean, is what? Again, it's going to vary by department. That, Most, isn't that kind of crazy that it does vary by department? Yeah, it drives me nuts. <laughs> and is has this discussion been had like nationwide? Oh, there's... There's so many good things and pieces of advice and recommendation out there. One of the things that's kind of painful right now is, you know, every morning I get a, a news recap from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. They send this email out to all the all the members of there and they have you know, the psychological services group. And so you get these updates and I, I, I usually just kind of pass them over. But lately with all the police reform, so it's just headlines from around the country and the piecemeal randomness of of this city's doing this and this city's doing this and this city's doing this and this city, and it's all over the place you know same that's driving me nuts because i'm mm -hmm. like there's already been groups that have studied and reported and told us what we need to do to help the the, the world of policing rise up and do better we yeah. that information's out there from from wonderful brilliant people who've come together and have laid it out for us it's there but yet we we don't have that national standard each state has certain you know uh, most states have a group like in california it's the california post um you know it's the police officer standards and training so they set all the rules for um training minimal training requirements for all the departments in california so all the agencies police agencies here in this state are you know need to comply with all of the post recommendations but they're all you know it's a minimum standard and our post california post is kind of heads and tails ahead of most of the country some some states don't actually have that organization most do have something similar to like what we have so they do set some standards but there's so many things that are not included in that um mm. and, and so it is a bit you know random it's hard, I think, to make a one-size-fits-all, everybody must do this, because if you think about it, I think there's about 18,000 different police agencies in the U.S., and I think I read about 50% of those have 10 or fewer full-time officers. So, you know, when you've got podunk, tiny little town in the middle of, you know, the Midwest in a very rural county that, that's, you know, that's a whole lot different than LAPD. Right. So it's it's hard to have everybody on the same standard and the same expectations when we've got a lot of different makeups for a lot of different departments. That said, there are some fundamentals that I think every department should be held to. Um, and, and one of those is the debriefings after an incident. And the one that, that almost no one is doing that's been talked about for a while is regular mental wellness checks. You know, at this point, you get a psyche eval when you're hired or before you're hired. And if you're in a critical incident, you may or may not get one. More more are starting to do that. And then the only other time you're gonna be required to see the psychologist is if you have messed up and you're in trouble and you're referred for a fitness for duty evaluation. And at that point, your job is on the line. Someone is saying that they think you're not fit for duty. And that is a scary evaluation to have to be a, a part of. Because then you're going in and, and yeah, if the psychologist judges and decides that you are not able to go back out, well, then you're, then you're off duty until you can fix whatever that problem may be. Right. Well, and also, just for the public's health and welfare, it's important to do that. Sure. I mean, there clearly are a lot of police officers that are unfit for duty. How, how do we stop what happened in Minneapolis? How do we stop that from, from happening or at least mitigate it? So, I mean, again, I, I see everything through my lens as a psychologist, as yes. a police psychologist. So I'm sure there are things beyond my realm that, that also answer this question. But for me, the things that I think we could be doing different that would really make a difference are the regular 
annual mental wellness checks. If, it, from my perspective, when I look at people like you know Derek Chauvin, the the officer that that murdered George Floyd, and we see what happened there. He, I would say, I would be willing to guess, and I, I don't know him, I've never met him, I don't know m- much about his career other than what I've read in the news and, and whatnot. Police officers that get to that place become that. Right. They're not that when they're hired. Right. To get hired as a cop, you have to go through what often takes a year-long application process where they are digging and poking into every aspect of your background, your Let's life. Let's be clear, though, that's in some places. In, in other places, it's pretty easy. It, again, smaller departments that don't yeah. have the resources, probably right. probably so. Yeah. I, and want, then, I shouldn't say pretty easy in, in comparison. In comparison, yeah. yeah. But the vast majority of departments have a pretty, you know, have, have a similar process in that mm-hmm. you're going to go through the application. You have to pass a written test. There's going to be a, a background investigation, mm-hmm. which really I think is a hugely powerful key part it, that it should be a well-done background investigation. Um, you know, they're talking to people who you know, people from your past, your landlord, your ex-wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, They have your the whoever. resources to do that for every single candidate? They do. Now, some agencies take far more care than others. Right. Um, the, the wide variety of people that I see that have passed their backgrounds, some agencies I work for send me the most amazingly clean candidates and others that are trying to hire a lot, eh, less squeaky clean. But they've they've all gone through and it is, you know, gone through this background. They also do a polygraph. They do social media checks. They, you know, they make you list all your tattoos and you know, so they're they're looking for. And if there is somebody who is just flagrantly racist, has, you know, you know, been out there toting white supremacy, like they're gonna they're gonna see that somewhere in that digging around. Mm-hmm. So the 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 blatant racist folks are likely weeded out during a good background process. Let's say maybe they're not as openly because, you know, we all know that people know better than to admit to such things most of the time these days, and it could be more subtle. So at that point, what comes next? You've got oral interviews with, you know, police administrators, um, a polygraph, you know, coming along in there. And once they pass all of that, that's when they come to the last, they get their conditional offer of employment. So they're basically like, as long as you get through these last two steps, you're you're good to go for the academy. And the last two steps are the medical evaluation and the psych eval. So by the time we get them, they have been heavily vetted, poked around, you know, in in and in, in looked through in their past. And we get a we get a pretty clean group of people. But then we get to do more digging and we get to ask questions at this point that they're not able to ask before. So about mental health and background and psychological treatment and history. And so, you know, by the and then if they get through these evaluations, then they go on to the academy. So for us, that vetting process, that psyche eval is a really important place. And I've had a lot of conversations with other psychologists, you know, in the past few months, like, what are we missing? I've had I, I taught a workshop a couple months ago for other police psychologists on, you know, some of the things we do in these pre-employments and had someone say, how do we screen out the cops who kill? And I said, we can't. <laughs> and that was not a good answer that we can't. We, we can't because we have to what we're doing here is predicting the future. Right. We're, we're saying, how do we know who is going to be that person who does that later? Predicting the future is incredibly hard. Figuring out who may be, un, uh, you know, subtly racist or biased is also incredibly hard. So that said, we do a whole lot of things. We've got our psychological tests that we give. We ask a lot of crafty questions and we dig as deep as we can to try to, again, weed out anyone who we think could potentially become that person down the road who could be a cop who kills or who, you know, is racist and biased and is treating people improperly. So, uh, you know, that's one big thing that we want to be very cautious and make sure we're doing a good job of screening up front. But I would say, um, and so much more to say about the tests and the screening, but gets really nerdy and, and detailed. I would say that the officers who end up having the most problems are the ones who, once they get on, are in a department where that is the culture. That is that 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 those types of behaviors are acceptable. So and as that's a young bad. officer, they learn at that. Have you ever seen the documentary The Seven Five? I have not. It's a great documentary about Michael Dowd, mm-hmm. who has been a guest on the podcast. Who was a he was a terrible cop, and talks openly about how he was corrupted and how his first day on the force he he witnessed corruption and was told to shut his mouth and yep. and 
further went on to become a drug dealer and robbing drug dealers and just it's a crazy documentary you would enjoy it particularly from a psychological perspective because he's talking about it after having served time um just showing the the images from the time and telling the stories it's the culture of each individual department is different Mm -hmm. and some are great there's a great video of uh floyd uh flint michigan where um these police officers after the george floyd death they show up for these protests and tell these people the protesting we're going to march with you like we're a part of this community Mm -hmm. too like we are we're your friends like we are police officers but we are not the person who did that thing and we wouldn't do that thing and we we want to show you that we support you and that we're here to help that's Mm -hmm. what that's what really we want it's beautiful it's so cool to see them all march together and they're hugging um that's what we want right that is and and i think that one of the biggest things when we you know how do we prevent these these issues is we need to look at the individual officer level but we need I, to look think, at the culture. I think that is very limited because I think the racist, angry cop who kills has developed that way over time. And I think right. one of the pieces is the culture in the department. Is this something that's acceptable? Is there corruption in that department? And so certainly better oversight and tracking is a really important thing um, you know, that, that should happen. But the other piece and the one that, that, that I focus more on from my end is the wellness. You know, is this somebody who is burning out? Is this right. somebody who has gone into a, a dangerous place, you know, psychologically that they started out and they were fine when we screened them up front. But, you know, over five or 10 or 15 years, they've seen so much. And, you know, there's some one that there things happen in your brain that change the way you think and see and perceive the world when you do this type of work. Right. And when you get to a place where those where that those processes have have really taken their toll and somebody has gone down this kind of dark path, it's hard to come out of that. And the, and the way they react to the world and the individuals that they see on a daily basis is going to be very different than what they look like when they were hired. So if we're not regularly checking in and seeing who might be at risk for going to that dark place, that bitter and angry place, you know, we're not able to catch them before something happens. And that's where, you know, for me, my, my big platform is regular wellness checks. I'm not the first one to come up with this idea. It's been suggested by task forces and study groups and people who know a whole lot more than I do for, for a while now. But in reading, there was a wonderful um, uh, uh, report to Congress that was put out um, by the COPS, which is Community Oriented Policing Services. So they sent this, like, 60-page report to Congress March of 2019 and described in detail, you know, all the things that we should be doing to pay attention to officer wellness, one of which was we seem to think that some regular checkups would probably help, but the problem is no one's doing them and we have literally zero research on, you know, what, what are they helpful? Can they prevent this? And I believe they are. So my, you know, my next big thing is to go and explore and, and, and do that research so that we can show Hey, this does help. We can we can if we're touching base and we're getting people in, then we can catch the problems as they develop and before they become a major problem where someone's interacting with the community and they go awry and do something awful. Let's take care of them along the way and catch the problems before they um, you know, before they become behaviors that are problematic. 